G'day guys, and in today's video I'm going to do a little bit of a response to one of my favourite YouTube channels, and I'm also going to go a bit into depth about how I forge battles. So, before we get into my techniques, I'd just like to cover or clarify a couple of points that were made by a favourite channel of mine, that works. Now, if you're not aware of that works, uh, shame on you. <laughs> but uh, no, in reality, uh, Matt uh, Stagma and Ilya Alexeyev from uh, Baltimore Knife and Sword, who most of you will know through Man at Arms, the Ormi channel, uh, back when they were running, uh, have started their own channel and uh, do episodes on what they're getting up to. And they also do a, a, a series called Your Edge. And in their most recent video, Ilya went in a little bit of detail about how he approaches forging edge battles. Now, this is not me saying that, Eli uh, that Ilya is wrong. Uh, I have the utmost respect for that man, and he is an incredibly talented smith, and he makes some amazing work. Um, it was more of a little bit of a clarification. Now, Ilya did state this in his video, but I just figured it needed to be kind of doubled down on a little bit. Ilya, in his video, covered the, uh, the formation of bevels by compression. So, when forging the bevels, you're trying to strike into the surface of the work to try and drive the, uh, the material back into itself, rather than drawing or pinching the material out to create a bevel. And he did cover the fact that that is primarily for traditional steels, for bloomery steels, for, uh, you know, like wrought iron, stuff like that, where there is an almost wood grain-like pattern due to the repeated folding and forge welding and the various inclusions and stuff like that 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 uh, kind of creation uh, creates. So he, he did state that that is primarily for his work with traditional steels, but I figured it bore mentioning that modern steels do not have that you know, that issue. They don't need to be forged by compression. Is it good practice? And this is where it comes into question. Um, <clears throat> he made the statement that uh, a lot of modern bladesmithing societies, including the American Bladesmith Society, teach pinching, the pinching method. Uh, and he said that you know, that is wrong. Now, it's wrong if you're working with traditional steels, but there are lots of uh, situations in a bladesmith's life where you do need to pinch the material, or maybe need is not the correct term, but it would be preferable to create depth. Now, uh, for a for instance, I have a number of blades uh, lying off to the side that have ricassos. They have a section of material that is not part of the edge. It is flat. <clears throat> it is stepped up. Now, you could potentially forge by compression these thin bevels and then step your ricasso in, but then you're not guaranteeing that flatness there. So my method of forging bevels in this instance is to have the ricasso, the original thickness of the material, and to pinch out the material to create the heel and then the depth of the blade, which gives me my nice cutting depth. Of blade and this works on small bowie knives, large bowie knives, hunters, all kinds of knives where you do want that extra deep, extra wide blade because the other way is simply to have a much wider piece of material and work that down but that tends to be very difficult for those of you who've worked with large pieces of material you'll know what I'm talking about. The other reason may be pattern development in uh, Damascus, if you want to stretch that pattern out towards the bottom. But the opposite is true. I use both methods in my workshop. When I'm forging, you know, sabre grinds, when I'm forging uh, flat grinds, where I'm trying to get as much depth as I can, especially on kitchen knives, where I'm trying to really widen that blade out. Sometimes with kitchen knives, I will use a cross pin to continue to draw that material out. Whereas with daggers, on the other hand, I will forged by compression. I will forge that material back in on itself because I do not want the dagger to widen out. I want the dagger to remain thin. So I think it's not, again, it's not a correction so much as a kind of an add-on, an addendum 
to what Ilya was teaching. He does a very good video, and I do recommend you go check it out because he does go into depth on why he approaches the uh, uh, question of beveling the way he does, but that is my take on it. Modern steels, you don't need to worry about it. And I'm going to do a quick demonstration piece and show you what I mean. Okay, so the first method I'm going to cover is Ilya's method, the method that he was showing in his video, which is forging by compression. In this case, we're going to swing the hammer into an angle, and the angle is going to be matched between the anvil and the piece, and the hammer and the piece. So the piece is intersecting the angle between the anvil and the hammer. Until it's late in the day, my hammer eye is not as good as it was. And again, you always want to be working both sides of the material. But as you can see, I'm trying to develop a very tight Right. So, we have a defined edge bevel with a slight radiusing. And I would work this piece up from the edge to the spine. In, uh, you know, in forging my compression, you want to work tip in. And although my terrible hammering skills today are, leave something to be desired, you can see how I've developed that forge line on both sides of the bevel. And our width has not increased dramatically. So now I'm going to flip this around and we'll show the pinching method. So in this case, we've still got that same angle, the same angle to the anvil, same angle to the, ham, uh, angle to the hammer. But my hammer is going to climb up the piece a little bit and I'm going to be trying to establish a higher bevel. And almost using the heel of my hammer to bring that material down. So, as you can see, I've still got that defined bevel line, but it's not as sharp because I haven't come in at as sharp an angle. And it has swooped quite a bit more than the other side, as you can tell. And it's gained quite a bit of width. Now it's not forged down to final finish or anything like that. This is a piece of mild steel for demonstration, but as you can see, it does curve it quite a bit more. Ilya did cover that in his video, and we'll discuss why that happens in a second. So there you have it, the pinch and the push method. Now, is either one better than the other? I think it's contextual at this point. Uh, if you're working with old steels, ancient steels, uh, traditionally made steels, where you have a grain in the material, not uh, apart from the sand-like grain we get in steel, but actual lines of material separated by various inclusions and stuff like that, you definitely want to go with the compression method as not to tear those fibers apart. But in modern uh, mono steel, which has been melted and cast and then drawn out, you don't have that concern because there is no grain. And so therefore, modern steels can be manipulated to shapes that you wouldn't necessarily be able to get in a traditional steel. For instance, the giveaway knife I did recently where I drew out the guard integrally and I drew out the heel of the blade integrally. And you check out my two hour knife video, which I'll link up a card up there uh, for you to look at, wouldn't be as viable in the traditional steel as it was in the mono steel as it was. So that was my little addendum to how I approach bevels. And just to clarify uh, on hammer technique, both methods require good hammer eye can hammer and hand and eye control and as you can tell on that first heat I was uh, a little off because the end of a long and hot day today and uh, I've been swinging the hammer all day but um, it's important to use a hammer that you're comfortable with 
not one that's too heavy or perhaps even too light, uh, one that's going to bounce all over the place on you, one that you're very familiar with. I always advise getting a good hammer and practicing with that hammer. This is my favorite hammer. This is the one that does like 90% of the work in my workshop uh, when I need it to. So get yourself a good hammer. I'm going to do a video on hammer techniques in the very near future. I think I might do that for Friday, so keep an eye out for that one. But until then, thank you very much for watching. Have a fantastic week, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers, guys.